Victoria. I will end my story at 21 years. I give these words to my father. Ride the skies. I am the shield of the emperor as I ride. Dear Moko, grow up to be a healthy and big girl. Daddy will make an attack on the enemies. When you grow up, you will understand. Seven centuries ago, the legendary Kublai Khan brought his Mongol troops to invade Japan's home island. A raging typhoon decimated and turned back the invasion fleet. They called the typhoon the Divine Wind, which in Japanese is the word Kamikaze. In 1944, top Japanese commanders called on the Japanese tradition of self-sacrifice. So the leaders authorized suicide by their finest young men as a weapon. The plan was outlined in the field to the men on October 19, 1944 by the Vice Admiral Onishi. He speaks to his loyal men he tells them that they are gods, and he inspires them to kill themselves for the good of the nation and loyalty to their gods. Listen closely to what he said. Conventional air attacks cannot save us. Each of our planes must knock out an American aircraft carrier. This is possible only by crash diving. You are already gods without earthly desires. But the one thing you want to know is that your own crash dive is not in vain. I shall watch your efforts to the end and report your deeds to the throne. The plan was brutally simple. The pilot would guarantee accuracy of his bombs by riding with them to the target and die with his eyes open. Because of their loyalty to their nation and their gods, these dear men did it with an enthusiasm akin to that of the Jesuits of Rome just as the Nazis used the media to prepare the people's minds for the extermination of the Jews, and just as the papal-controlled media will soon do the same to prepare for the extermination of God's dear SDA people, the kamikaze leaders celebrated the death of their own people by the media in the newsreels. In the face of defeat, the kamikaze frenzy increased. Finally, the emperor himself spoke to his people. They had never before heard him. They had never heard his voice. Many worshipped him as a god. He announced that the cause was lost. <laughs> When he announced their defeat and surrender, the vice admiral who had inspired so many fine men 
to kill themselves while killing others also ended his own life after apologizing to the nation. I wish to express my deep appreciation to the souls of the brave special attackers. And I apologize to the souls of these dead flyers and their bereaved families. I wish the young people of Japan to find the moral in my death. With all the fervor of spirit of the special attackers, strive for the welfare of Japan and for peace throughout the world. Oh friend, if you live and die for a cause, make sure it's a cause worth living and dying for. If you live for the lovely Jesus and his truth, his church, you will live forever. If you live for the cause of the Catholic charismatic attack against God's SDA church, you will die the second death just as surely as these poor men died the first. Welcome to part seven of Catholic Charismatic Attack on God's SDA Church. Although you may see some shocking things on this program, that's not its purpose. The purpose of this program is to uplift the lovely Jesus and his truth in such a way as to strengthen and encourage God's faithful SDA church against the horrible attack going on against it. If you don't believe there is such a thing, just read Revelation 12:17. Well, let me remind you that this program is solely for Seventh-day Adventists and that as an ordained SDA minister, I'm standing in loyal defense of God's SDA church. Now, the date, December 30, 1902. Arthur G. Daniels is the president of the General Conference. He's 44 years old. That night was quiet. Elder Daniels chatted with his assistant. And then with I. H. Evans, the general manager of the Review and Herald Publishing Company. It was a warm comparatively warm, snowless winter evening. The Review and Herald, the largest, most modern publishing house in all of Michigan, was doing very well. A few blocks away on Washington Street, the tabernacle bell rings out, announcing that it's time for prayer meeting. The prophet of God is still alive. And now it's time to go to the very tabernacle where she had spoken words inspired by the Spirit of the Most High. If the men that night had looked at their watches, it would have been just about 7.30. But that would have been about the last normal thing they would have done that day. Moments later, the lights went out, and from across the street came the eerie glow that was unmistakable to anyone who had seen the sanitarium fire. The Review and Herald main building was in flames. It was an inferno with terrible explosions as the windows blew out of superheated offices. From outside you could hear the sound of machinery falling as the second floor collapsed. Within an hour, the Review and Herald publishing company was gone. Since the burning of the sanitarium less than a year before, there had not been a supernatural fire such as this since Sodom and Gomorrah. Nothing was left but a pile of charcoal and scattered brick with broken presses lying around the melted plates of Kellogg's book entitled Living Temple. Oh, friend. Within one devastating year, the two major institutions of the SDA Church had disappeared in smoke. And Fire Chief Weeks of the Battle Creek Fire Department said, quote, There is something strange about your SDA fires. 
with the water poured on acting more like gasoline. Battle Creek was the great center of God's remnant church on the earth around this world. Nothing could touch it without God's permission. Like the great empires of the past, Battle Creek seemed to be a kingdom which would stand forever. No man expected what was coming. No human being saw it. But one little woman who had been despised and had it been possible would have been disfellowshipped by some and sent off to an island of the sea. Oh friend, months earlier she had warned the great Battle Creek in words that ring down through history. In 8th volume of the Testimonies, page 96, she said, quote, Unless there is a reformation, calamity will overtake the publishing house, and the world will know the reason. Unquote. And now it had happened. And the message was painted in the Michigan sky for weeks. An eerie reminder hung over Battle Creek. During the blaze, you see, a large coal pile had caught fire. It burned for weeks, clear into February, reminding the world of what had happened and that God means what He says. Oh, friend, would God's people listen to the instruction of the prophet of God? One of the first acts of Dr. Kellogg after the fire was to take the book Living Temple to an outside publisher for printing. After receiving the telegram telling of the review fire, Sister White wrote, Sometimes I have thought, I would attend no more large gatherings for our people, for my messages seem to leave little impression on the minds of our leading brethren after the meetings have closed." Unquote. She, in the same context, told how she left the meetings, I quote, pressed down as a cart beneath the sheaves. You can look it up in series B, number 6, page 56. The smoky message over Battle Creek brings us to one question. Would God's people and leaders follow the instruction given by the prophet of God? The prophet who would protect them from calamity. The prophet sent to them in love. Oh, friend, what was there so ominous about that book of Dr. Kellogg's that never got printed by the review? Was there something so important about the plates of the book Living Temple that a whole institution set up by God was destroyed? You're going to see that principles and events surrounding that book and its movement would bring what Ellen White called the Alpha of Apostasy. And you're going to see that the Omega would come, of which in series B, number 2, page 53, God's prophet said this, quote, that she trembled for our people. Is the Omega really here now? Do you think that it is in the form of the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church? What is this great apostasy of the last days, anyway? If we can find the answer to that question, you'll know something of the Omega of apostasy that would attack God's SDA church that I'm standing loyal to. Friend, get ready for a shock. Here it is. Great controversy. 
I quote, The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Quote, Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy, she declares. Again I'm quoting, Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel now and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. Oh friend, does this great power have anything to do with the Omega of the apostasy? God's prophet tells us that the power just described is the great apostasy of the latter times. Is there really a great Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church? Well, friend, if you're afraid of the facts, you may turn this program off at this time. But if you want the facts and want encouragement and strengthening by the mighty power of our God, then hold on, friend, because here we go. In parts 1 through 6, you've already learned some of the history of the Jesuits of Rome and their demon-possessed work of infiltration and destruction. You've learned the great goals of the papacy as brought to view in Great Controversy 565 and 566 to number one, regain control of the whole world, number two, restart persecution, and number three, undo all that Protestantism has done. You've seen something of how they're doing it already uh, in telling us that they love us while planning to cut our throats. You've already seen in parts 1 through 6 how after Vatican II of the early 60s, the Jesuits, along with other orders of Rome, had brought in the great changes so as to befuddle the people so much, uh, you know, and so to rapid bring in rapid change, uh, so to be able to slip in papal principles without even getting a protest thus bringing all back to the Mother Church in accordance with the plans of Vatican II. You've already learned of Rome's plans of rapid change, change to be foisted upon our culture and upon the churches in the beat of the music in the churches and in society, in the changing of the worship styles, in the brainwashing of the small groups, in the bringing in of people out of themselves to confess hidden things about themselves to their pastors such as the Catholic priests get. By You've already learned of the loving NLP methods to get that accomplished. You've already learned uh, of their plans to unite the churches in love and unity, to stop the mouth of protest, to stop the mouth of the Protestant Reformation, to disfellowship, to proscribe, to excommunicate those who would dare get God's three angels' messages out to the world. You've already learned about their plans to stop the mouth of anyone who would obey God rather than man. Oh, friend, now, before we expose this thing for your own good, for your own strengthening. We're going to take a closer look at the beast itself. Watch closely. Vatican 
City covers 108.7 acres on a site known to ancient Romans as Mons Vaticanus. Operating its own bank, post office, pharmacy, and commissary, Vatican City employs nearly 2,000 people, mostly lay workers from Rome, and has about 300 residents. It's the world's smallest country. Like a virus infiltrator, this country lies within the capital city of another country, in harmony with its policy of infiltration for centuries. Its monarch, both a state king and church bishop, uniting both church and state, claims to reign as the vicar of Christ, but is in actuality the Antichrist of Daniel 7, reigning as visible head of the beast power of Revelation 13. Rome has been the home of the popes since the late 14th century, but the modern state of Vatican City has existed by treaty with Italy only since 1929, beginning the fulfillment of the Bible prophecy that its deadly wound would be healed. Here it is, St. Peter's Basilica, nearly 700 feet long and 450 feet wide, which can hold 50,000 worshipers, and on the church's holiest days, nearly a quarter of a million people have gathered in the piazza. A cross sits on the top of the 82-foot-high Egyptian obelisk, which was moved there in 1586 from the site of the Roman circus. Oh yes, this piazza is the largest sun disk in the world today. More than 400 feet high, a lantern tower crowns Michelangelo's dome. Sunlight magnified by the yellow stained glass window, illuminates Bernini's throne of St. Peter's, where Satan dwells. Everywhere we see the combination of paganism with Christianity, forming what SDA evangelists have for many years identified as the beast power, the seat of the man of sin, the most dangerous of false religions as poison is rendered more dangerous when mingled with food. I have in my hand a cassette tape of an interview with the ex-Jesuit priest and Jack Chick talking with some Seventh-day Adventists. I'm only going to play a short bit of it now, but as you listen you'll see that Rome, like a kamikaze pilot, is making its dive of death and attacking right now. Listen closely. I hate it. I'm not in secret. I'm in public places all the time. Are you worried about going across the country? No. No, no, no. God of my trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I either hear among the charismaticus and above a lot of commotion and laughing, but today in the serenity of my daily life, I see the power of the Holy Spirit, even now, as I speak. The, as the days go by, then I'm in a better position to deal with this ugly, horrifying matter of infiltration and penetration, because they are ugly, they are horrifying, and they are scary. Then, uh, in cases like this, what the Jesuit wants to see is a complete, a complete unbalanced situation of any Christian group, of any Christian community. Whatever is Christianity, and whatever the pure principle of Christianity are being preserved and kept and defended, they will have something to do with. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, unless, unless the pastor preaches and exposes the whore for what she is, yes. He'll never get rid of his, uh, his uh, people who have moved in. Definitely. The rush to take over this country has been demonstrated as never before. Okay. Uh, in this book, Dr. Rivera reveals what took place the last night of the Vatican II Council when they told the world that we were all brothers and sisters in Christ, that the, the uh, heretics were now called separated brethren. Mm -hmm. They put on a whole new face. 
But in another section of the Vatican, there was a whole new picture going on, and Dr. Rivera happened to be in the meeting. The superior Jesuit general, Pedro Arruti, who was the black pope, was present. And all of the Jesuits under oath and induction, as Alberto was. Then we had the office of the Inquisition was present. And every Jesuit general from around the world had been flown in for this special meeting. Believe me, this is one of the most important meetings ever held in the Vatican. And it was just at the completion of the Vatican II when they told the world they loved us. Pedro Rupi had a special high mass given, and he announced to all of these people present that they would now launch the final purge of the last inquisition. It was not going to be launched. And Dr. Rivera went white because he realized that Rome was now ready to go for the jugular and take us out. And uh, so he's shown me what is coming in the future plans for the U.S. and for all of us and how they've been infiltrating every church. We've had your people moving in, uh, planted for the purpose of causing disruption and to shut your mouths if you ever open it against the Vatican. So, what like point was this meeting? <coughs> the final night of the Vatican II Council. Oh. What, what, 63 or 64 or something? Yeah, like 63 after. Yeah, 63. When people read, watch, and hear, they could not see it, but I can see it. Because what I knew and, and the matters and the issues that I was briefed as a Jesuit under the stream of the induction, most Catholics, they would not even know what is about to take place. The program involved the constant infiltration of Catholics into every local community. And they will come there as people they are willing to listen as people that are willing to be tough, as people that are willing to comply with, as people that are willing to join the church, as people that are willing to do anything to become a good Seventh-day Adventist person and a member of a local church. But they'll be there watching, they'll be there influenced, they'll be there transmitting ideas, they'll be there changing the courses of the scripture and they'll be there to make you more sympathetic and more conscious aware first that the Roman Catholic institution was always a Christian church. Uh, just as they were taking the open induction, they were taking open induction with the idea that they will be either murdered or they will be taking their life if they break one single principle. They could not, in no way, they will not be forgiven. <coughs> now, that is the reality of what Roman Catholicism is all about, because as, as the book of Revelation uh, 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 dramatized in chapter 17, she is the great whore. It's not only a whore, it's not a great whore. And it's not one great whore, it's the great whore. But that means she is the mastermind of everything we have witnessed against Christianity every 24 hours around the clock for 1,600 years. She could be communism. That was wrong. You said communist security? That was never the truth. That was wrong. Well, the Communist Party was founded by Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And so was the Nazi Party. Socialism started with socialism as the first experiment of the Jesuits. Then they masqueraded themselves and said, we fight communism. For reason they are in the street right now, <coughs> they said they are fighting abortion. <coughs> Roman Catholicism fighting abortion. Do you know what that means? Who is fighting for people? And kept throughout the centuries the ways of abortion in their convents and monasteries. But most are uh, pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical, uh, uh, how do you pronounce that? Uh, uh, industry are in the hands of the Jesuits. What that means is all part of their economy. Uh, by this time, 
you can see that whatever they come out to fight against them, that means they are creating a smoke screen, uh, a cover-up, that you cannot see the relationship of that very thing with <coughs> In certain evils, there is one evil here, there is another evil there, and we are going to fight here, Lula. By the end of all this struggle against every evil, they have you working with them in every area. And you will be there. By the time that you want to get back, you say, well, they don't seem to be so bad after all. They are fighting, draw. They are fighting alcohol. Nevertheless, they have the greatest distilleries of whiskey in the world. We had a lady come into our front office the other day, and she said, uh, did you know that the Catholic Church is the Waka, and the Waka is the Catholic Church? And we said yes. And she broke into tears. She says, I've been trying to tell people this, and nobody believed it. Well, our brother had already proved a sin. She was 14 years with the Mafia. And when she was in upstate New York, every time they had the dawns of the Godfathers come in from Philadelphia and Miami and all over, they'd bring in a monsignor or a priest with him, and they'd all sit at the table telling who they were going to kill. They deal with the greatest transactions in banking, insurance companies, and real estate. Individuals are being assigned by the millions, not by the thousands, by the millions. I mean, people, lay people, uh, fathers and mothers and young people are being advised by their counselor, by their priest, by their confessor, to go into churches and to uh, and to do certain things and to carry out certain missions. Oh friend, no matter how much information you receive about the great harlot of Revelation 17, which Seventh-day Adventist evangelists, Bible workers, pastors, and members have been exposing from the Bible for over a hundred years, you would only have just a tiny little glimpse of the whole picture. God's prophet tells us in the book Great Controversy in the chapter called Religious Liberty Threatened that the papacy is the great apostasy of the latter times. But here's a question. If for the good of God's remnant church, God allowed this great Roman apostasy of the latter times, which Sister White says is the right arm of the devil's strength, if God allowed it to attack God's remnant church in the Catholic charismatic attack, what would we expect to see? Would we expect to see Roman Catholic men being manipulated into leading positions in our institutions? Faculty and staff at Atlantic Union College, appointment of consultant. This is a letter from Dr. Lawrence Garrity, President. I am pleased to announce the hiring of Dr. Frank Mazzaglio as a consultant to Atlantic Union College during our time of building adult education enrollment and our community-based capital campaign. Dr. Mazzaglio brings considerable experience as an academic and as a practitioner. He has been chairman of two area MBA programs, the academic dean and the assistant consultant to the presidents of four New England colleges. He has also been the chief executive of three chambers of commerce and of one of the state's largest anti-poverty agencies. Officially, Dr. Mazzaglio will serve under contract as a general consultant to the president. However, in order to be effective in his duties, Dr. Mazzaglio will assume the title of executive assistant to the president. His primary area of responsibility will be in community relations. A Roman Catholic and well-known in this area he will be a real asset in our attempt to become more a part of the community in which we live and work. Working out of the Division of Continuing Education, he will help us increase our continuing education and ADP enrollments and raise funds for our capital campaign. I look forward to working with Dr. Mazzaglio and trust that you will welcome him warmly to the Atlantic Union College family as we all continue to move forward together to meet a promise with the future. Signed, Lawrence Garrity, President. A year later, we noticed that the school calendar is listing 
in March, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then uh, Sabbath Easter celebration, and then Easter Sunday. Now, in this year's calendar, they have got Easter sunrise service down as well in the Lancastrian. Uh, this is school newspaper. Uh, just last week, Atlantic Union College, March 31, 92, Vice President Tesler released. After a meeting between Dr. Lawrence Garrity, Charlene Tesler, and David Rawson, um, Garrity recommended that Charlene Tesler's contract not be renewed. Um, the point is that she is the Vice President of Advancement and Development. She's been um, employed by the school for several, quite a few years, and there was give, no reason was given for her uh, dismissal. So she is now threatening a lawsuit. The interesting thing is that just a week later comes this announcement out from the president's office, April 992. Dear AUC faculty and staff, um, in order to advance the cause of in institutional development and fill the vacuum created with the departure of Dr. Tesler, college administration is reorganizing the Advancement Development Department to advance projects which require focused attention. The former Office of Vice President for Institutional Advancement will not be replaced in an attempt to focus limited institutional resources on raising dollars for vital campus needs. The reorganization calls for Dr. Frank Mazzaglio, consultant assistant to the president, to assume coordination planning for development projects. This is our friend, the Roman Catholic. This added responsibility will come in addition to his current responsibilities in community relations and continuing education until suitable alternatives can be arranged. In his additional capacity, Dr. Mazzaglio will function out of both the Continuing Ed Department office and planning room on the second floor, formerly the office of the Vice President for Advancement. If there really was such a thing as a Catholic charismatic attack on God's church, would we expect to see a similar charismatic movement in the Roman Catholic Church as we see in all the churches around the nation? The Catholic World Report July 1992. It all started here. Pittsburgh is where the worldwide Catholic charismatic movement began. In 1967, a small group of De Questney University Catholics experienced a baptism in the Spirit while on retreat at the Ark and the Dove Retreat House about 15 miles outside of Pittsburgh. In the 25 years since, the renewal has touched the lives of some 10 million Catholics in the U.S. and some 50 million worldwide. Charismatic renewal at a prayer group in the U.S. A charismatic renewal timeline. February 1967, a group of students from De Questney University experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit while on retreat in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 1967, the experience spreads to other places in the United States, particularly the University of Notre Dame and to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the Word of God prayer group is founded. 1969, the beginnings of the National Service Committee are established. 1971, the People of Praise is founded and Building Christian Communities by Steve Clark is published. 1974, more than 30,000 charismatics meet at Notre Dame, none other than the Jesuit College and University. 1975, the International Conference in Rome. Rome gets into the picture. Pope Paul VI permits Cardinal Leon Joseph Sunens to use the high altar normally reserved for the Pope at the closing mass. Oh, friend, you see how exalted they feel this charismatic renewal is. It will sweep the world, uniting Protestantism, Catholicism, and spiritualism to lead to the law to put God's people to death. The National Sunday Law, the mark of the beast. 
1977, General Ecumenical Conference in Kansas City, one of the largest charismatic conferences ever held. 1980, Man and Woman in Christ is published by Clark. 1982, Steve Clark forms the Sword of the Spirit, an international interdenominational community of communities. 1992, the 25th anniversary conference is held in Pittsburgh. Oh, friend, since Roman Catholic priests take their sheep through the stations of the cross in the Catholic churches, if there really was such a thing as a Catholic charismatic attack on God's church, would you expect to see Catholic charismatic preachers taking their sheep through the stations of the cross? Here, Pastor Jan, is the Stations of the Cross presented at the College Church, Atlantic Union College. Here, station number one, called Jesus is Condemned to Death, and a chant. Station two, Jesus takes up his cross, and a lesson, an anthem, Latin chant. And station three, Jesus falls the first time. The chant, lesson three, an anthem. Here, station four, Jesus meets his afflicted mother. And the chant, lesson four, the Latin Stabat Mater, and the fifth station. The cross is laid on Simon of Cyrene, the chant, We Adore You, O Christ. Station six, a woman wipes the face of Jesus, the chant, We Adore You, O Christ, and we bless you. The anthem, He Was Despised. Station 7, Jesus Falls a Second Time. We Adore You is the chant. Lesson 7, Surely Hath Borne Our Griefs. Station 9, Jesus Falls a Third Time. Actually, He did not fall a third time, but in the station He did. And the chant, we adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. The lesson, the Latin Ave Virum. Station 12, Jesus dies on the cross. The same chant again, and the anthem is in Latin. Station 13, the body of Jesus is placed in the arms of his mother, which is not in the Bible, but it is in the Stations of the Cross. Oh, friend, since Rome murdered over 50 million Christians in the Dark Ages, and will do the same again soon, according to God's prophet, to help sentence God's people to death uh, concerning and surrounding the issue of the National Sunday Law, since Rome controls Hollywood to dish out murder, uh, you know, uh, mystery theaters, and all types of horror, uh, if there really was such a thing as a Catholic charismatic attack, would you expect to see murder mystery theaters at one of our SDA colleges? Here is the Atlantic Union News Notes, published April 15, 1992. Here we see Phi Alpha Theta Initiation Ceremony at the Bartlett Art Gallery. Dr. Beach will speak on the importance of the Magna Carta. And down here, 
we see the S.A. Spring Formal at the Radisson Inn. It will be a murder mystery dinner theater. On the other side, advertises Friday, April 17, Vespers, The Way of the Cross, which is the Stations of the Cross at the College Church, and down for Easter Sunday morning sunrise service in the Miller Chapel. All are welcome. Yes, I have no yes. desire to spend any more time, words, or influence in anything but the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's right. Let's see now. Uh, you know something about a giant, a super giant building in Santa Domingo. What do you know about that building? All right. Uh, this uh, Santa Domingo, Santo means holy, Domingo means Sunday. Mm. Holy Sunday is the name of the capital mm. of the Dominican Republic yes. in uh, the island of Dominican Republic, the uh, western half is Haiti. Uh -huh. The eastern half is uh, the Dominican Republic, and this is a protectorate of the United States. And the last time that we had military operation in this area of the Caribbean was in 1965. Uh -huh. uh, of course, it sits just east of Cuba, and the uh, Cuban situation uh, makes it strategic it sits just west of Puerto Rico mm. which is a uh, protectorate of the United States yes and then a chain of islands goes all the way down to the north coast of South America mm. known as the Antilles oh. or the West Indies yes and this is the Caribbean Sea now the things that are happening in the Caribbean are paramount to closing events because this is where Columbus established Catholicism in the New World when he planted the flag for uh, Queen Isabella of Spain. Yes. When he planted that flag in the Western Hemisphere, Rome claimed the Western Hemisphere as a Roman protectorate of the Church of Rome. Yes. Now, uh, it went on to develop under English and Spanish yes. and French settlement and so on, and everybody knows the history of the United States. But <clears throat> since this establishment of the first settlement was on the uh, Rio Ozama, uh -huh. Rio means river, Ozama is the river going up through the middle of Santo Domingo, uh -huh. and the first settlement where, which is now marked by a place called the Columbus House. Yes. And the Columbus House sits at the mouth of the Rio Ozama. Across the river from the Columbus House is a park named <coughs> Faro a Colon. Uh -huh. And the Faro means light uh -huh. or fire. Yes. Uh, light to Cologne, Columbus. Uh -huh. And this is marking the 500th anniversary of Columbus planting the Catholic flag on Western soil. Yes. Now the Pope is coming back to dedicate this mm. humongous building yes. uh, in Santo Domingo. Now I've got a book called uh, Making America Catholic. And uh, that whole area you're talking about is considered part of America, isn't it? Oh yeah, uh, religious freedom based on a republic for the people by the people yes. has now become a democracy uh, which is majority rule and we've never found that a democracy uh, was safe because the first democracy run was by Aaron who took the majority vote and made a golden calf and yes. led the people back to Egypt yes. now uh, I'm glad we're in a democracy I prefer it over a dictatorship well, or America something. really is not a democracy it's a republic uh, it was established as a republic, but yes. we are now running it democratically as a democracy on majority vote. And so, so now we no, longer, into it. we no longer uh, ask for 
uh, law according to the commandments, we ask for law according to majority vote. And what is right is what most people want to do. And this is what will allow the Sunday law to come mm. in, yes. is the fact that the most people are resting and worshiping on Sunday, therefore yes. the majority day will be Sunday day. You said law according to the commandment. What commandment? Are you talking about the Constitution or the commandments no, of God? No, the, the original commandment is the Ten Commandments, and you have to know that God never gave man the right to legislate. God said, I'll make the rules. He yes. made Ten Commandments, and then He made statutes, and then He made judgments. Mm -hmm. Now, statutes are the fine print on mm -hmm. the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Uh, he explained the statutes, such as, uh, uh, I, thou, uh, not to commit adultery, but if a man look in lust, he committed adultery in his heart. Mm -hmm. And so that's a statute. Yes. And then you come to a judgment where someone is brought in before... Uh, the powers that are mm. empowered over a given society mm. and they said this person committed adultery and the judge has to weigh the evidence mm -hmm. and make a judgment concerning the statute based on the law. Mm -hmm. And so all law action was originally to come from God and we were only given administrative privileges mm -hmm. with the law of God. We took our administrative privileges and through kingly power, we said we want a king over us like the kings of the nation around us. And using that kingly power, mm -hmm. uh, we then started making laws from the executive, judicial, and congressional branch of mm -hmm. the kingly power. Now, and by against God and the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. with the state against the church, which is the church of God. King and Carr, are you now talking about the U.S. government or the church? I'm talking about any government. Since 1962, uh, when uh, they had the Vatican Council, the plan has been to move into Protestant churches. Yes. Protestantism means protesting against the system of Rome. Yes. They protested. But now the effort is to move back into the churches and to change their format, whatever their format is, mm -hmm. change the format because yes. people begin to think that format is holy. Yes. And so first you shake up the system, whatever system they have, and when it gets totally confused that the thing won't run smoothly anymore, then yes. someone says we must bring this thing back into order. Yes. And that's when the beast says, here's how to bring order, make this rule, make this rule, yes. make this rule, and bring them under your yes. policies instead of under the principles of heaven. And pretty soon you have a earthly church enforcing its policies yes. instead of obeying God. Yes. And the church very quickly turns into a peer pressure group and then a persecuting group and then a kingly power yes. and a dominant group over its subjects until either the people are totally mind controlled yes. by the hierarchical power or they break loose in yes. a new Protestant movement and, yes. s and start a, f a new freedom movement yes. and uh, they're known as offshoots or whatever. This so we've had this thing repeat wave yes. after wave yes. where there's a clamp down. Well, that's happening now, isn't it? Oh, again, we have a, a great effort to break loose. Now, most people who break loose from the former order, whatever the former order was, tend to go into anarchy and disorder because they have no basic yardstick mm -hmm. of what morality is. The Apostle Paul said he wouldn't have known sin if he hadn't known the law. Yes. And he said, when I knew the law, sin revived in me. That didn't mean that it made him a sinner to learn the law. It meant that the law revealed what a sinner he was. Yes. And so... Well, we have no standard of righteousness unless we have the moral law. Right. And this last effort that is now very popular, just this last week they had the uh, Thursday uh, National Week of Prayer, and the theme of it was meet at the courthouse. And who and, had this? Uh, all right, this was an executive order from President Bush. Yes. He's had two former executive prayer Sundays. Hmm. This time he called for a prayer Thursday because there was so much uh, rattling uh, over the prayer Sundays yes. that he had a prayer Thursday but the, the real significant thing and I got it in the local paper was meet at the courthouse yes. and the ministers and lawyers and all the leaders Meeting went together. in front of the courthouse and the mayor came out and the chief of police and for a half hour they prayed hmm. that there would be 
moral legislation. In yes. other words, they're turning to the state. Instead of turning in repentance back to the law of God, they're turning to the kingly power of the state and saying, you make rules that make these guys behave. And the papacy can only force toward death. Um, we expose the fact that Rome, in the Vatican II Council, was already planning on uh, subjugating the Protestant churches and all organizations through, rap number one, through change. Of course, they infiltrated them. Uh, also, getting much change, 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 to throw people off of their own belief system. This is what I was referring yes. to. The change of any system yes. causes confusion. That's right. People say, we used to come here at 8. They say, come at 9. Yes. They say, we used to sit down when we sang. They say, stand up yes, or clap right. your hands. Whatever, change it yes. so the people Are no longer off. see their old pattern yes. and then they begin to uh, lose confidence. Yes. yes, they might have been to an extreme thinking a certain position was holy and mm. another position wasn't. Yes. But if you shake them up, at yes. that time you can introduce a new doctrine. New things, that's this right. This is where they're shake. That's why the shake up. Yes, and of itself, this uh, an element of change such as you know, uh, uh, singing out of something instead of something else or doing some insignificant thing. There's no sin in that of itself. But when you see the whole picture of what Rome has planned, then it becomes significant. The Jesuit order will have a list uh, made up in the United States of people as well as, in as institutions they are worth trusting. And Mr. Walter Martin, I even mentioned to him in this confrontation with him that his name was listed in that list. Why Mr. Walter Martin, 25 years ago, he even wrote about the cult to Mary, a book about Mary, and 25 years after, he have a list, as a matter of fact, that I have uh, with me, a list of, of cults where he lists the most dangerous cults, and all who are in the list of his most dangerous cults are Christian signs, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, starting with the Mormons. And suddenly, I thought, I was expecting that he will place at the top of the most dangerous cult Roman Catholicism, by where the Mormons. Now, the Mormons become the victim of Roman Catholicism not only, but become the victim of Mr. Walter Martin, because even the Mormons are the product of Roman Catholicism. What I know is this, that even the Seventh-day Adventist denomination yeah. has been placed under the greatest setup, and, and a real setup, of all the history of the denomination. And the proof and evidence is that now the, the leadership is already uh, in a position where they themselves cannot play the role of a, a Frankenstein no longer because they're being unveiled, they're being discovered and their intents and their true intents and cases where uh, already most of them has been already uh, trained, prepared by Jesuits to be where they are. Uh, I have, happen to have a, a good friend. His name is Stanley Falkenberg, the father of Bob Falkenberg, the president of the General Conference. And Stanley Falkenberg was the evangelist in the New York Conference when I was a boy growing up. I remember well going to his evangelistic meetings, and Sonny Lou was the singing evangelist there, yes. and how we felt the Holy Spirit there. It was just, I love to go Amen. as a boy. We had been away from home for a time because my father had passed away, yes. and when we got back, we got an urgent call, and we found out that the Falkenberg, Stanley Falkenberg and his wife, had been trying to reach us for... Uh, about three weeks, they said, and hadn't been able to reach us because we had been away from home for, to the funeral. And they were so excited about Freedom's Ring. Yes. And that started a, a series of conversations on the telephone that went on for a number of weeks, a good number of weeks. And Stanley would call and talk for 45 minutes at a time. And then one time he said to me, he said, Bob, the, the Jesuits are pulling the strings in our church and they're sitting back and laughing at us. Oh. And that was Elder Falkenberg's father? Yes, yeah, Stanley Falkenberg. He's passed away since then. Well, that's amazing. Uh, I, I, 
you know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Well, now, here's a question. Could the Jesuits actually be mean enough and smart enough to think about doing something like that? <laughs> I would say it would be their prime objective because this church has the book Great Controversy. Amen. This, book, this church has the Three Angels' Messages. And the book Great Controversy has in it the quotation that our responsibility under the third angel's message is to expose the inroads of spiritualism Amen. and the rapid and stealthy progress of the papal power. Yes. So there is no entity that the Jesuits would be more interested in neutralizing on the face of the earth than the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. The apple of God's eye. Well, right. I thank God and he's in control. Amen. But that is shocking because what he said uh, uh, goes along with what the ex-Jesuit priest said. Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. Oh, yes. Of course. Oh, friend, since Rome loves Sunday, and it's their greatest celebration, and they're going to lead to that law, oh yes, which I keep you updated on every month in my monthly letter. And if some of you ha don't receive my monthly letter, you can get it simply by writing to me, Pastor Jan Markison at P.O. Box 68, Thompsonville, Illinois, 628 Nine zero, and I'll send it to you free so that constantly you will be updated as to what is happening leading to the devil's law that he wants to use to put God's people to death. Also, you'll see what our mighty God is doing to fight and overcome the devil. Praise God, friend. It's extremely inspiring. If you'd like to have this monthly letter, if you don't already receive it, simply write to me. I have also a fax that you can fax me a message any time of the day, day or night, 24 hours a day, and I will receive every single one of them. Uh, the fax number is 618-627-2522. Now, here's a question. What happened to that man for after he burned the great controversies? My, my understanding is he was made pastor. You see, we have a problem here. That was his reward? I guess so. You see, that's the problem we have over the years. If something happens, the minister does something wrong in one area, they, they're either promoted or they're moved to another area instead yes. of being disciplined. Yet they will disfellowship someone from the church uh -huh. if they they start standing up for truth the and truth. principles, yes. they will disfellowship and remove them for yes. office. But you let someone burn some books or uh, do some immoral things, they'll either promote them or yeah. move them to another place. Now, I think it's probably coming clear, real clear, to everyone watching right now what's going on. This is not a Seventh-day Adventist attack against God's Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're talking and describing a Catholic attack against God's Adventist Church. Exactly and so you see what's happening. Like the Bible says, the dragon was wroth with the woman yes. and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I say that this makes a tremendous zeal and love for God's SDA Church in the heart of anyone that sees this attack we want to stand loyal to God's SDA Church, stand in defense of it against this Catholic attack, which is tremendous and uh, getting worse every month. It becomes very obvious the papal plans of burning, of threats, of uh, illegal trials, everything the papacy, the Vatican of Rome, did in the Dark Ages, she is doing again. God's prophet, and this is amazing, but right under our noses, right but before our eyes, but I thank God, God has his true Seventh-day Adventist people Amen. who are standing for the truth, who are standing loyal to God's SDA church against this Catholic attack. You were just telling me about, uh, about how you wanted to give Bible studies on Friday night. So just tell us about that. To encourage the people that were censored, and I understand illegally for... Uh, 12 and 18 months. Uh -huh. They was the organist and pathfinder leader and had done so much in the church. Yes. Uh, the first deacon, you know, head deacon. Uh -huh. And they were just crushed. So my uh, What were they crushed by? Uh, for, for a lot of things that had happened and they had been censored for things that weren't true. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, that had been told on them. And so we decided, they said, would you like to come over and pray with us? And, and we said, yes, we would. And believe me, there were about, I guess we had 16 
uh, people there at times. Praise and the Lord. And where was that? Uh, Someone's at, home? Yes, it was uh, at the people's homes that Wonderful. were censored. And uh, a lot of people, and, and you'd just be surprised, we started studying uh, the spirit of prophecy. In a home? Yes, and we just loved it. Oh. And, and, uh, With about 16 people? Yes, but then it got larger. Wonderful. And it was even larger than the prayer meetings. Praise the Lord. Well, I know that Pastor and must have been happy about that. Well, he was very upset, and he told us that uh, that we were all going to be censored for this because oh. it wasn't authorized for the church. Uh, uh, you mean a Bible study? Well, we called it a study of the spirit of prophecy at the I time. See. And, and, and uh, of course, we read out of the Word of God when it came to that point. We had prayer for the church and for the One. people. God died for all of yes. us. And he loved those people, Amen. too. Amen. And, and I just said, oh, God, help us to do what's right. Yes. Well, we continued and continued. and uh, With your study in the home. Yes. And we were told we would be censored. And the hmm. pastor come to us and talk to us. And they took my husband out of the teaching position. And I was released from being an yes. assistant now, you sure must have been committing a terrible crime for that, studying the Bible. Well, I really felt sad. Now, did the pastor uh, tell you uh, why you couldn't uh, have a Bible study in your home? Because all through the years, the church, Adventist churches have really been encouraging the members to have Bible studies and, and all kinds of studies in their homes and give Bible studies, and it's wonderful. So did your pastor tell you why he didn't want you to do it? Well, he, he said that we were interfering with the things on Friday night that were taking place at the church. Now, we had had a Revelation seminar before that, but uh -huh. that was over. Uh -huh. And so we weren't, in fact, the man who gave, who helped with the Revelation seminar, uh, came to our Friday night group to help support the ones that were discouraged. Yes. And he led out in, in our um, studying of the Spirit of Prophecy. Yes. As one reason why the pastor said you shouldn't have the meetings in the homes, uh, did he uh, talk about the word authority? Oh, by all means. In fact, he came to our home and said, said don't you people believe in church authority? That's what he asked us. Uh, and so because your meeting wasn't authorized, you couldn't ha you couldn't study the Bible? Yes, and it also said that we'd have to go through the church if we were to have any other uh, uh, get program. Get per permission. Permission, yeah. that's right. And, yeah. and then when the older people in the church got upset because my husband wasn't teaching the older people's classes, uh, then the pastor and the elder came and said, would you... Uh, that we'd like to have you come back. Uh huh. Wonderful. And and we and we had been coming just to church, but just not as officers of any kind. And, yes. And then the Sabbath school superintendent said to my husband, "Now we want you to come back and teach the class, but you have to teach within a certain framework, and also we don't want your wife saying anything in the class." Yes. And so. What people wonder, why isn't Dale saying something in the class? Uh -huh. And so I just mentioned a couple of times to people, and I cried. I, I said, well, I, my husband, I study, and he's the teacher, and we comment on the class. And, and, yes. You know. Well, then everybody in the class, people who would speak, they didn't want to say anything, and the class seemed so dead. And mm. my friends said, well, if you're not allowed to speak out in the class, then I don't want to. I see. And so it was kind of dead. Yeah. But... But you can't be quiet very long. When That's you have right. Something when the Holy say, Spirit moves Lord. on you. And I was, I was uh, just the, the pastor that just left our place. I had commented in the Sabbath school class, and we were studying at that time on uh, uh, the leadership and how Jesus uh, uh, felt towards it, and how they were not listening, and uh, all these things were brought in. And I said, well, you know, leadership is a wonderful thing, and yes. we've always looked to leadership. Yes. But I said, you know something, if you study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, all you have to do is study the spirit of prophecy. And she says they're going to make the same mistakes and they're going to get way out. Huh. And, you, and you can't follow leadership if it's not going towards the kingdom. Yes. And when I said that, I was taking care of a little girl at the time, so I got up to take her out of church. But uh, right before the pastor had his study, he got up and commented that he didn't think it was right for anybody to comment on the leadership. Yes. Uh -huh. So, and I didn't know that, and I, I just didn't know it until several people told me about it. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry he feels that way because I am... I am not bound to leadership except that they follow Jesus. Yes. But when I first came into We love leadership that follows Jesus. That's it. And a long time ago when I first came into the church, the pastor said to uh, me, don't... I said, how am I going to know when all this is to take place? How am I going to know when... You mean the, the prophecies? 
Yes, how am I going to know? And that was over 40 years ago. He huh. said, let me tell you how. When it's time to give up the eggs and the milk and follow and the end time, you will get it through the conference. It'll come through our papers. You oh, will I know. See. They will tell you this. Yes. And my husband said, you know, we really believe that. Uh -huh. But we can't believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. We can't believe that anymore because... Uh, are they telling you to give up these things now? I haven't heard anything like that. Uh, people. Yes. I've met people from all over. There's hundreds of them. All over. And this. they're real Seventh-day Adventist churches. They're not Baptist churches. There's Adventist churches. Well, I just thank the Lord that... Um, that Ed and I are not alone in this thing. Amen. I've met a lot of God people. has his his people all over. As a matter of fact, he has at least 144,000 of them yeah. that he's preparing to stand for Jesus and to be real, true Seventh-day Adventists. And I thought, well, I've got to stay in there because the church yeah. is going through. Yes, it is going to go but through. Then but then I found we, out what the church is. Yes, that's right. The church is God's has, people. That's right. And and my husband says the. Our church building is not going to go up. No, they're going to. And then I read in Ellen The papacy White's, and their friends are going to get it. And I read in Ellen White's writing, which I was kind of said, I shouldn't have said that, and Sabbath school one time, and I said, they're talking about what constitutes the church. Uh -huh. And it's not, not word for word, but I know what Ellen White says. From the beginning of time, the honest in heart constitutes the church of God. Praise and the Lord. And when I read that, I said, praise you, Lord, because now I don't have to feel guilty yes. if I don't go to a building. Yes, a building, the papacy and their friends are going to get them, but they won't get God's Adventist people. Well, I want to be faithful. And I, I, I just pray for these dear people yes. that are deceived. I'll tell you one thing. We had the New Age stuff come in, uh -huh. and the Sabbath school, superintendent stood up and encouraged us all to go to the library and get this book and that book and this is good and this is good uh -huh. and I thought well so I just raised my hand and I said I stood up and I said I don't know anything about these books and they may be good books uh -huh. but I said why are we going to the library to get books by other authors when God has given us yes. Adventist Home, yes. Bibles and Readings for the Home Circle, yes. and all these wonderful books? Why? I said, isn't that counsel what we yeah. should be? That's right. And I heard one soft amen <sighs> and no other comment. Yes. The, the Sabbath School Superintendent says, oh, yes, that's true, but uh, then that's where it stopped. Yeah. What you told us about the uh, Bible study group in the home, which is wonderful and ma would make God very happy, would make Ellen White happy, would make all the prophets and apostles happy, would make all the church leaders happy. Uh, but if it didn't happen to make the dear man you were talking about, who was your pastor at the time, happy, uh, then we must go by the Word of God. Isn't that right? Because to study the Bible in people's homes is wonderful. Now, uh, did you say that that dear man isn't pastoring any anymore, but is he selling cars? This is what I heard recently, that he was selling cars. And, but he's not your pastor anymore. No. Yeah, we'll pray for that dear man. So it teaches us that we must put our eyes on dear Jesus and not on humans. The lawsuit between the homosexual group, uh, and you know what I'm talking about, who actually won that? Oh, uh, this might be of value to discuss that lawsuit a little bit. It started with a lawsuit uh, of a little uh, independent Adventist church in Hawaii, and the church sued them for the improper use of the trademark name Seventh-day Adventist. Now, they couldn't have done that in the 1970s, could they? I don't believe so. I believe that uh, this could not be done until... We established ourselves as a business corporation. And that happened in what year, 1980 or 81? Right in that era. It's hard to pin down exactly when it happened because there is a period of time between when a legal document is signed and when the product of that document begins to hit the market. Yes. And uh, uh, if we keep searching, we will find that it is a actual agreement uh, on paper, a legal agreement, yes. which makes it a commercial operation. Yes. At that time, we should have paid corporate business taxes on our products. Mm -hmm. 
We have a real problem on us now because we have assured the courts of the land that we are a business corporation with a trademark patentable name yes. and that we are in a commercial operation. We have not paid commercial operating corporation taxes all this time we have run a corporate there. We pulled the roof in on our own head, in other words. Tax By becoming a business instead By of a church. By becoming a business instead of a church. Hmm. Now, as we made the business our primary business, and as we sued under our business mm -hmm. rights, this was submitted in what is known as a legal brief. Mm -hmm. Now, the last line of a legal brief is called the prayer. Mm -hmm. And in the prayer, the prosecution, the one who's bringing the complaint before the land, courts of the land, ask for certain things to be granted in the sentence of the court. Mm -hmm. And they ask in that trial for all literature with the name Seventh Adventist to be confiscated, for certain damages to be awarded at the amount of so many dollars per day that they went on in using this trademark privilege. You're talking about the church in Hawaii? Yes. Okay. They, they, they put what in the prayer mm -hmm. what they wanted to have yeah. pronounced by the court. Yes. Then the court yeah. session was altered enough in its locale and dates of sessions that when the session finally met, which was official, the man Merrick who was the minister of this little church, was not there. So, by default, hmm. the case went to the accuser. Yes. All right, and they used the bottom line, the prayer, hmm. which was composed by Ramak, the Catholic lawyer, who yes. now claims to be some other faith, Presbyterian or something. He keeps changing his story. Yes. They call, uh, the review called him a Catholic lawyer originally. Yes and we're proud of the fact that it was a Catholic that was working for him. Now they've said he's changed his religion. Yes. But the purpose of his work is identical. Yeah. All right. They, it was Ramek who wrote the prayer in the original brief, mm -hmm. and that became the sentence of that original court. And the general conference published in the review that they won the case. Mm -hmm. They did not win it. They got it by default, where their prayer became the sentence of the court. Yes. All right. They then thought that it would be better, instead of, uh, they had such a drop in tithe and confidence among the people because of the fact that they were suing among, the brethren were suing among the brethren. And yes. Of course the Bible says, why will you go to the courts of the land when you have a disagreement? Don't you know you'll judge angels and yes. so on? Mm -hmm. And so there was so much uh, upset among the laity yes that the tithe drop-off was horrendous. Yes. So they thought, what we've got to do is take on the kinship group uh, who uh, call themselves Seventh-day Adventist homosexual group yes. of the church. And everybody knows that a homosexual is right out of Sodom, yes. and that will be an easy case to win. Yes. They failed to uh, recognize the fact that the homosexuals had been given uh, civil rights and had come under federal protection yes. and you can't fire a homosexual you mm -hmm. can't even hold him up to ridicule you can't call him any names or call him even immoral mm -hmm. you can't say he's immoral because there is no law mm -hmm. that establishes what morality is therefore uh, we can't try this on morals and so on. Yes. Well, when they got into the case against the homosexuals, which they thought would be a pushover, and that would give them precedence to go back and clean up. The, uh, there were several other mm -hmm. uh, churches brought under affliction under these threats. Yes. Uh, I've heard numbers from 20 to 30 different groups that were threatened. Yes. But uh, just dealing with the two groups, the Hawaiian church and the kinship group, because federal law was backing the Homosexual. uh, homosexuals, they won. I was led uh, to the General Conference building through a set of uh, what I consider providential 
circumstances. Now, this wasn't a long time ago, was it? No, this was just recently. And uh, I was led to contact uh, persons in the General Conference who I feel are uh, honest servants of God. Yes. And I'm not saying they all aren't or they all are. But uh, I felt there were certain people I could talk with and reach understandings with that would be a help to me and to the church and so on. So yes. I went to see these persons. And I had uh, two brethren with me at the time who were asked to leave the room uh, because the conversation I was in was private enough that the persons involved did not wish hmm. it to be heard. Yes. So they were a asked to be excused. As they were walking out of the building, they passed a room. The door was open and a number of people were sitting in there. And uh, they did not know uh, what was happening themselves because... Uh, they didn't know what was going on. They found themselves entering the room and picking up the duplicated uh, sheets mm -hmm. that were in stacks along a table as you walked into the room. And they picked up the sheets and had a seat and began to observe what was happening in this room. And... Uh, they found that they were sitting in the General Conference Executive Committee session and that the agenda which they had in their hands mm -hmm. included the presentation by the lawyer Romick, the Catholic lawyer who led the uh, law group yes. in their suing of the... Uh, dissident bodies of Seventh-day Adventism, whatever their yes. reason is, in the lawsuits. He's been the key yes. leading the way. And he stood up and said that we have lost the suit to kingship, kinship and that the name Seventh-day Adventist is generic. We no longer can sue for the use of the name. Hmm. And this was heard by two witnesses mm -hmm. from his mouth in general conference executive session. Mm -hmm. I have the agenda. I have the two witnesses. God's people are to go forward in the name of the Lord, yes. Seventh-day Adventist, and hold up the banner of Christ's righteousness for I'm not saying you cannot be sued for you will be threatened with every threat Satan can come forth with yes. but God has said the name is generic yes. use it and go forward praise God and it came from the lips of the opposition yes. okay. to the church in executive committee session that is official amazing Those papers that they picked up, you have them. I have a set of those papers. Yes. Well, I praise God, brother, that that God is 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 looking out for His Seventh Day Adventist Church. Amen. Jesus Christ is the head of it, and I say praise the Lord. And nothing can touch God's church without His permission. Isn't Amen. that wonderful? Amen. And as an ordained Seventh Day Adventist minister, I'm standing loyal to God's SDA church and I know you Amen, are too. Amen, brother. Because this Jesus is, is the God's head. church and we're to bring every honest soul into this church. Yes. Stand for the Lord. Though the heavens fall, yes. though worms eat your flesh, yes. though they slay you, Amen. We shall see God. Amen. And even people who are illegally disfellowshipped, I say to them, do not leave God's Seventh day Adventist no church way. because you cannot be illegally, illegally disfellowshipped from God's SDA church because 
God is the only one that no can man, he said, no can man. take you from my hand. That's right. That's right. Praise the Lord. What and an hour to be alive. Brother. It is. And, and, and the time is coming when God's Seventh Adventist Church will be in no buildings. The, Rome is going to get the buildings. Let them have them. They're going to, God's people are going to be in the woods, in the jails, in the fields. And, uh, but that's his church. Amen. And it's his people. And I say, praise the Lord. And he's going to purify it, perfect it. He'll use it to reach people by the millions around this world, by the billions. The devil can't stop it. The whole world will be lighted up with the glory of God. Amen. And he's going to take his church to heaven. In the last part of this video series, I shared with you the amazing interview with the apostolic elder Michael Capps and others there at the interview that we had near Bakersfield, California. Well, many of you have been wondering what has happened to these, uh, this experience. When I first learned about it and shared it with you in part four, there were 100 churches, apostolic churches, who had switched and we're now keeping God's Sabbath because their bishops read the book National Sunday Law as Michael Cap shared with them. Well, you saw last time in the interview, Michael now said it was up to about 300 churches, praise God, who had switched and are now Sabbath keeping churches. You've been wondering, well, what has happened to Michael Capps? What's the latest thing on this uh, tremendous, unbelievable situation that our mighty God is moving? Uh, well, what has happened? I've been getting letters and communications from the Adventist physician who has been studying with Brother Michael. The last I heard was Brother Michael has been accepting all of the truth of God that he's been learning, not only God's Sabbath, God's salvation, the second coming of Christ, the spirit of prophecy, oh yes, the uh, health message, did you say health message? Yes, he's accepted the health message. Uh, as a matter of fact, in essence, this dear apostolic elder, which has tremendous influence all over this country, is becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, and is already more of a Seventh-day Adventist than many Catholic charismatic people, cool Bart Simpson people, who love to sing and swing and sin and celebrate. Oh friend, I'm going to show you again this dear man and uh, what he says about a tremendous situation, and I'm going to show you that this Tremendous situation inspired people in Boise, Idaho, the group, remember, who uh, bulk mailed 100,000 National Sunday Law books out to the entire city of Boise, Idaho. Hold on, friend. Listen to what's going to be happening. And then I'm going to share with you that this group, Adventist group, who bulk mailed the books to the entire city have inspired others who are going to be uh, bulk mailing or putting out the books to entire cities and then have me come, have a meeting, have a call, invite people to come forward and start new Seventh-day Adventist churches in this country. I really consider this a tremendous privilege to be here with uh, Pastor Michael Capps and Dr. Hollingseed and with you, the author of the book, I've had many conversations with these two gentlemen uh, regarding this, and I've talked to Pastor Michael Capps in this tone. I said, what, what's happening here with your people is confirming the uh, spirit of prophecy, or the pen of inspiration, as we often refer to it, yes. as the thousands will be coming into the truth, into the Sabbath message, at the end of time. Yes. This confirms to me that we're at the end of time. We are. We've yes. never seen a phenomenon like yes. this before. That's right. That's right. Never. And this right. Uh, really puts this thing in this proper perspective. Yeah, not in the history of our denomination. That's true. And as Michael Capps, uh, <clears throat> as I explained to him in the past, that the pen of inspiration pointed out that whole churches, and when she said whole churches, I think she means whole denomination. God is going to choose people who may seem unpromising, who may be as cold as stones, who have no knowledge, mm -hmm. but He's going to enliven them and awaken them 
And, and I'm seeing this very thing. Mm. And just as he remarked that uh, he read the book a number of years ago, but it didn't have the effect that it had now. Yes. So God's Holy Spirit is working now at the end of time. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. <clears throat> it's true. And I, I could also say here that uh, when I first became interested in the National Sunday Law book, I read it once. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do about this book? I read it twice. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit was convicting me more. And I read it three times. Three times must be the number. Well, these men read it three times also. <laughs> yes, it was three times. And I said, Lord, <clears throat> I've, been in, I've been raised, I was born and raised in this church. And what have I done to get the three angels' messages out? Amen. The three angels are mighty angels. Yes. That I've envisioned flying over the Grand Ronde Valley where I live. Yes. And uh, at that point, the message seemed to be kind of like a blip on a horn or a small toot. And here these mighty angels are speaking in a loud voice. Yes. And I wasn't hearing this loud voice. So I said, Lord, do you want us to put this, this book out here in this territory in a mass distribution. And this seemed to be the impression that the Lord was leaving with me. So we got a bunch of concerned Adventists together and uh, we ordered 10,000 books to begin with yes. out of uh, Louisiana from Anderson at that time, which he, which he purchased from you. Yes. That was our first event. And uh, we made the uh, distribution by the group of us getting together and putting these in mail bags, mm -hmm. sealing them and taking them to the post office on, by a Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Then we got the youth of the church and all those who participated financially, and uh, we went to the city of Legrand the next day on the Sabbath. Legrand, what state is that in? And that's in that's in Oregon, Oregon. Grand Oregon. Uh -huh. That's about 15 miles from where I live. Okay. Anyway, we went like a mighty army and covered that city in about three hours. Praise we had the Lord. Two books left. Huh. And you know, if you flew an airplane across the town and opened the bay doors yes. and dropped out the books, yes. you couldn't have done a better job. Yes. Wonderful. Neighbor really to neighbor were talking. The pastors and the pulpits were talking about it. Hmm. People in the restaurant, there was a couple in the, from our church that overheard a conversation in the restaurant where uh, a group of people were talking and they said, that book is well documented. Hmm. And they spoke very favorably of the book. Now this is in a public. Yes. We're getting many comments. Uh, from people who acknowledge the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to comment that uh, this thing got to the point where even the editor critiqued the book. Editor of what? Editor of the local Le Grand paper, hmm. the Grand Evening Observer. And it was a favorable. In the newspaper he did that? This was in the local newspaper. Huh. It was a favorable Marvelous. critique of the book. And I'd like to read what the editor printed. Uh -huh. I wrote him a letter. And he titled this letter, Expression of Freedom. And I addressed it to the editor, and I said it might be of interest to those who receive the National Sunday Law book to know that the author, Pastor Jan Markison, is a credentialed, licensed minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Markison has a television program and ministry called Revelation Now on satellite TV. Satcom, Transponder 17, I least had an opportunity to view the author of the book if they wish. There's a lot of dishes in that valley. Mm -hmm. In the near future, the people of Grand Ronde Valley, including Adventists, will have to make a life and death decision on a specific issue of the Mark of the Beast addressed in the National Sunday Law book. This is historical and present Adventist teaching. Due to certain religious and political events that have occurred recently and because of our love for you and our Lord, we were compelled to act as we did especially since you could rightfully approach us in the future and say, you knew this, but didn't tell us. Yeah. That was our main reason. That was my reason for doing this, because God could hold me accountable and those who participated with me accountable. Yeah. And so what, what happened as a result? What happened as a result of this, we had a walk into the church. Mm -hmm. We had a couple that eventually ended up in our local church that uh, joined the church nearby as a result of National Sunday Law. Praise the Lord. And we had a lady that uh, was baptized due to the work of a Bible worker, but she said the interest developed in the National Sunday Law book. Hmm. Well, God gets so, all the credit. We can say that. It's His message. So I called another location in the nearby city, Baker City, Oregon, yes. just to see if the book had arrived there. 
And this lady said, you know, something wonderful happened today. She said, we went to pick up some children for Sabbath school, which we haven't been able to do. And she said, the lady of the house came to the door and said, I just went to the mailbox here a few days ago and picked up a book, a National Sunday Law book. I was terribly depressed, she said. Hmm. And after reading this book, my depression left me. Praise the Lord. And I want to go to church with you today. Praise and God. And the children says, Mama, what about us? Praise the Lord. And she said, you're going with me naturally. <laughs> she had five children. Praise God. So this is our Baker experience. Yes. And I just wow. praise the Lord. Now, if you would like to go into the Boise, Idaho experience. Yes, tell us what happened. Because yeah. that was... How many did you bulk mail to Boise, Idaho? Well, we bulk mailed 100,000 to Boise, Idaho. Hmm. Now, you can imagine that... Uh, even to think of that number is sort of... Uh, kind of scary. Yes, because it probably reached at least twice that many because oh, yes. there's at least two people in one house. Right. So we uh, contacted a group of concerned Adventists in Boise. And this group of people, we made a matching offer fund to them. We said, if you'll come up with half, we'll do the other half on these books. Mm -hmm. And so we got to a point of $12,000 between us, and we wondered, what's going to happen next? Uh, nothing was moving. Then I heard about a lady in California, Central California, Mrs. Bat, uh, from a Washington lady. She said, this lady has a trust fund. That her husband left just for the National Sunday Law book. Praise him. And so I gave her a call, and I asked the Lord before I called, I said, I'm impressed to ask her for $5,000. That would be about 15,000 books mailed to their final destination. Hmm. And I told her what our project was, that we were mailing 100,000 to Boise. She said, you know, no one's called me for quite a while. She says, I wonder who's going to call me next. And I have $4,950 hmm. laid away yet for this purpose. She says, I'm going to add $50 to this. That'll make $5,000. I said, praise the Lord. That's the exact amount of money I was going to ask you for. I said, this confirms to me, this confirms to me that God wants this project done. So there we had $22,000. Praise the Lord. The member says, well, let's wait till we raise it all. I says, no, we're going to step out in faith. Where yeah. sight ends, faith begins. So we placed the order with you, Jan, and we had about a six-week uh, waiting period there. But we've always prayed about these yes. uh, books before we sent them out, that the timing would be just right. Yes. And when the books arrived, we took them to a bulk mailer who mailed a whole 100,000 100, books to the Boise area, Nampa City, mm. uh, nearby Meridian, and uh, also to uh, Eagle, Idaho. Wonderful. Kind of a block. All in one week. All in one block in about a 10-day period. Mm. People said, let's just mail a few here and a few here. And I said, no, I want this to be a mass mailing. Because it's just like I mentioned, the impact is tremendous. Yes. When you do it all at once in a territory like that, everybody's involved. Everybody just, things just come in glue. Amen. Everybody's talking about it. Amen. Even the and devil wow. gets excited. The <laughs> loud <laughs> cry of the third <laughs> angel's message starts to take effect. Amen. I mean, the bugle really sounds with a loud blast when you do that. Praise God. And people are acquainted with the Sabbath truth and the three angels' messages. And people are accepting it. And not only that, people will accept in the future when they see the Sunday law coming in the open. It's going to be powerful because they've got it in their head, head from reading it. They may not, some may not do anything about it now, but when they see the thing coming, bang, the Holy Spirit will be a power there and they will act on what we've already got to them. Now, if they didn't have it in their head, they might be fooled and go along with the mark of the beast. Because of the logistics of this, we chose a bulk mailer. 100,000 books it would take a lot of personnel. Yes. It would, there's a lot of overlapping city and rural routes. So we chose a bulk mailer, and this worked out excellent. And uh, we only waited a day or two, and guess what came in the mail? What? It was your uh, newsletter. And Dr. Holland Seed's uh, uh, letter regarding the Apostolic Church. Yes. Churches at... 250,000 people. He, he Praise marked 250,000 yes. in that... Uh, uh, particular letter. So the number is fluctuating a little, but nobody can keep track of it because it's such an immense number. Well, it's not getting smaller. <laughs> That's not getting smaller. No. That's true. That's true. We've already heard this evening. Yes. And uh, after, I, after having received this, I was impressed almost immediately to get in contact with Pastor Michael Capps and to ask him to come to Boise yes. and to speak on this unusual phenomenon yes. of all these churches. Because nobody can deny it. And I thought, you know, this would 
This would open the whole city. I mean, this would re this was six weeks later. This would call attention back to the book, just like it did in Le Grand, yes. the newspaper article, with all the other events that took place. Yes. We wanted to keep this thing alive as long as possible, keep the attention on God's truth, yes. on his Sabbath. Yes. Well, he happened to have an appointment uh, in Texas for seven days, and I'm sure I knew what he was doing down there. He was getting some more churches to keep the Sabbath. Yes. So I yes. couldn't deny him that. Yes. Anyway, uh, but you did do something. I did the next best thing. So we contacted the local Idaho States, which is a large newspaper. We put in six ads. Hmm. We ran it six different times over a period of ten days. We contacted a couple of radio stations. We had those run 15 times at each radio station. Hmm. We put it into a a uh, advertising paper yes. that had a wide distribution once a week. We put it in there twice. Hmm. And uh, we also sent it to the, uh, or delivered it personally to the TV station for a printed announcement in their uh, TV announcing section. Yes. And uh, we'd like to indicate here what we said. Okay. <laughs> Go right ahead. I, I, I believe this. I believe this. We're capitalizing, Pastor Caps, on what you did and what, what what your church accepted, and that was almost immediately it came yeah. and happened. Mm -hmm. So I want to read that ad to you. I put in black caps, a national Sunday law book gains popularity. Here we were up, able to uplift Jesus. Yes. Amen. And glorify his name because of this incident. Then I made the following uh, outline here. Over 100 apostolic churches, 175,000 members, recently switched from Sunday worship on the first day of the week to Saturday worship on the seventh day of the week. This change to the true Seventh-day Sabbath was made after reading the National Sunday Law book. Hmm. I'm inviting you to read your National Sunday Law book again that you recently received in the mail and investigate the reasons why over 100 churches made the change. You will find this dynamic book fascinating reading as well as historically and biblically well documented according to evangelist Michael Capps of the Apostolic Church of Bakersfield, California. If you did not receive a National Sunday Law book, you may request a free copy while they last. Uh, Cove, Oregon, where I live, and I gave them the zip. And I received requests for the book since, although we saturated the area. Wonderful. Uh, we received, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier to you, which was not recorded, a Church of God brother wrote to us, excited, he said, to think that this many churches would accept the Sabbath, and his neighbor lady came in, and she was excited and wanted to make a copy of the ad. Praise the Lord. So, I mean, I can see nothing but enthusiasm Amen. For, for what's happening. Amen. And these people who want to state that uh, I'll believe it when I see it, yeah. uh, they, they cannot accept it. Well, well I faith. remember a man in the Bible who said something like that, don't you? Yeah. What was his name? Thomas. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we all know that. So even Thomases can be converted. Praise hey, the Lord. Sure. But I have something else to add here, yes. Jan, and uh, the rest of you gentlemen. That we had a call porter, 22 years in the work in the mm. Boise Valley. He was going house to house while this event was taking place. Mm. He went from home to home. He said over half of the homes had the Sunday Law book laying on top of their newspapers, on top of their... Uh, magazines. Yeah. He went to one home and the person came to the door with the book, his finger between the covers. He looked at uh, him and he looked at the book and he went back and forth. He said, you know, he says, I'm busy right now. He says, would you please come back later? <laughs> he says, and then we'll, we'll discuss this later. Well, the, sure. the call porter found out what was happening. And the call porter went back later and sold him three books. Praise the Lord. You know, a friend of ours in our own very hometown just a few days ago made this comment in Vancouver, Washington. You must have had a bulk mailing there because he said he went from apartment house to apartment house where he happens to be the manager, yes. uh, manager, excuse mm -hmm. me, a maintenance man, yes. and he was noticing the Sunday law books on dressers, on beds, mm. and different different homes. Now this is just his comment, just yeah. the last few days. So I praise God that praise there are other people. Yes. I, I think, what, what I believe is that groups of people ought to get together yeah. and they ought to accumulate a few funds. Uh, one person will know somebody else. And bulk Before mail. you know it, they can bulk mail and cover their territory. Yes. And we ought to build up. We ought to build up an inventory of books. Not that we sit on the books, yes. but that these books 
keep and keep moving these books along, and keep the inventory supplied because there is coming a time when we will not be able to purchase yes. literature yes. of this, yes. this type. That's right. Oh, friends, do you comprehend what you just heard? Friend, the Adventist brother is right. Time now is running out. Whatever we're going to do for God to reach people before they're dead, we need to do it now. Can you see that? Oh, yes. God is not joking with us. The devil's not joking either. Not only does the prophet of God uh, tell us these things, but events around us are screaming.